All right, we're back to continuity and limits for piecewise functions. This is the second installment of this little bit. Last time I did um, looking at this function and demonstrating that it's not continuous at zero. And that amounted to, if you're doing it very algebraically, taking two one-sided limits and seeing that they were not equal. And that's often what you, what you end up doing for a piecewise function. Now this function, um, let's, let's, uh, this was, I purposely chose this to be discontinuous. And let's modify it a little bit uh, so that it will be continuous. And then we're going to see there's a little bit of a different thought process. To show the function is discontinuous, I just had to focus on one bad point and say, okay, it's bad here. I don't really, it doesn't matter if it's good or bad elsewhere. It looks like it's good elsewhere. It doesn't really matter because it's just discontinuous at that point. Okay, so let's do number, example number two. Oh, I left my Sharpie open. Let's change colors. Example number two, let's say f of x equals, let's stay with cosine x uh, for x less than or equal to zero. And let's do something a little more interesting. Let's say uh, 1 plus x squared for x greater than 0. Let's sketch that. Cosine looks like this. 1 plus x squared looks like a parabola. It would be like this, but then it's shifted up. Hey, that looks nice. Looks like it actually joins up into a reasonably nice function. Actually, it's quite nice. So I'd like to show that f is continuous. And I'd like to show that it's continuous everywhere, or a fancy way for that is to use interval notation from minus infinity to infinity. Now remember, infinity is never, ever a number. I'm not asserting it's, a, it's, going, it's from the number minus infinity to the number in infinity. This is just a shorthand for the whole real line, uh, okay, with no, no <coughs> finite limit either way. Okay, now, there's a two-step process here. Let's call them A and B. A is away from a breakpoint. What does this function look like? It looks like one of our wonderful sort of library of good functions. Uh, so if x is less than 0, f of x is just the same as cosine x. This is our perspective on piecewise functions where one person has been asked to graph cosine x and they just happen to stop at zero and just use half the paper. But it's still cosine x. It's just a restricted version of it. Just You didn't happen to graph the whole domain, but that's okay. And what we can do is we can look in the book. I showed you this guy this before. The following types of functions are continuous at every number in their domain. Trig functions, they're continuous. Actually, proving that from first principles is pretty hard, but we don't do that kind of thing. Okay, It's one of our standard libraries. Cosine x doesn't have any dropout points like tangent or secant would, and so it's going to be continuous. We just sort of get that out of the library. If x is greater than 0, f of x is 1 plus x squared. That's a polynomial. It also is continuous. Another way to say that it is that it has the direct substitution property. But if you take the limit of x values, uh, sorry, of the y values of this function, it's the same as the y value at that point. Okay. So, basically, for almost all every problem like this, you just quote that kind of result. That's not something that changes from problem to problem. We're going to be putting together nice functions I into a piecewise function, and the only thing that can go wrong is right at, right at the, the breakpoint. That's what this is just recognizing. Yes, I know why nothing can go wrong away from the breakpoint. It's because we're putting nice functions together. Now, the only thing that would go wrong with that, what if this were tangent x, for example? I would not be able to say that's uh, continuous everywhere but away from the breakpoint, because there are points where that are not in the domain and that are um, points of discontinuity. Now, what about at the breakpoint? That's very similar to what we just did, but we're going to get a positive answer, a yes answer instead of no. We're going to take the limit, so this is step B, at the breakpoint. We're going to look at the limit as x goes to 0 from below of f of x. I say below often when it really means to the left, but x are lower values than 0 right here. Um, and once again, like in the last example, in the last video, as soon as you make the decision to 
analyze the left-hand limit. And that's purposely just half the story. We're not saying, oh, this is the only thing we have to do. But we're breaking it into two pieces, and each piece is simpler because, by definition, I will only ever have to put in numbers a little smaller than zero here. And as long as I'm doing that, I only can look at, I can just look at cosine. And so it's the same thing as if I were looking at the limit of cosine. And cosine has the direct substitution property. As soon as I get to this problem, it's like a brand new problem, and it's super easy because there's nothing that can ever go wrong with that function. It really does, it, it is, it behaves as if I was plugging in. And I'll, I'll the next example will talk about subtleties about that as well, because those can be confusing. But here, it's just great, okay? So here, the limit as x goes to 0 from the right. That allows us to just plug in the right-hand version of the function, the right-hand formula for the function. That has a direct substitution property. Now they're equal. And let's just make sure f of 0, that had better be the same value too. Well, f of 0, that's where we look here. We say, oh, that's, that's, that happens to be in this case. And that's cosine 0 equals 1. Good. Now, the great thing is, even if the equals had happened to be here and not up here, it still would have been 1 plus 0 equals 1, because these, these functions are trying to match. The only thing that could have gone wrong at this very last step is if I, I had forgotten to define it at 0, and then I would have an open circle gap in the middle. That'd be pretty silly, it seems like, because why not, why not just fill it in? And often that's a, a good way to think about it. Why not just fill it in? Just put in the equals. There's no, you're not harming anything. But in the next um, problem that I'm going to show you just now, that actually is a bit of a subtlety. And it's actually sort of the main subtlety of the whole subject, in a way. Okay, let me see if I can do this example in three minutes, or at least introduce it. Um, example number three. f of x equals let's say um, x squared minus 3x plus 2 over x squared minus 4. And, uh, oh, that's one of the definitions, okay. That's when x is not equal to uh, plus or minus 2, and it's equal to, let's say, let's try one third if x is plus or minus 2. So, What's going on with this function? I don't think we'll be able to finish the analysis of this function. But um, what's going on with this function is I've got a rational function here. I, the way you want to think about most of these kinds of examples, where you have some sort of function, and then there's just a one or two points where it's redefined to be some other number, um, is that you'd really like to be considering this function. but there's some a, one or two points where this this formula goes wrong and you can't use this formula to figure out the function but maybe there's some function some value that you'd like the function to have you want to think about this as you're the designer of the function not that it's handed to you even though in a in a calculus book context usually it is handed to you okay think about if, if you were trying to model something and you found that this is the formula that usually works but then you note if x is plus or minus 2 that's going to be zero in the denominator. And that's going to screw things up. And then you try to fix it. You try to give it a value artificially at those points. And what we're going to do is we're going to see, is this a good value to put in there, or is this not so good? And we're going to see it. It depends on wh whether x is, is plus 2 or minus 2. Okay. So, the, so in terms of good or not good, the question is, is f a continuous function? And in particular, is it, is it continuous at plus 2 or minus 2? And we'll continue this in the next video.